So we have Sue Rodman here. She's a habit, habitat biologist for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And she is going to present on fire and fire surrogates to enhance wildlife habitat in a time of transition. Hi, Sue. Hi, Marion. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Well, we'll get started. Um, let's take a look at this photo. Just wanted to entice your interest a little bit here. That's a big giant machine. I'll show you a picture of the whole thing here in a few minutes. But uh, this is up in Delta. This is our roller chopper. It's being pulled behind a D7 that's owned by State Forestry. And we have a partnership to do habitat enhancement work up there together on the bison range. Um, yes, it does say 80,000 pounds of love. <laughs> All right, Vision of Wildlife Conservation at the Department of Fish and Game. And um, tonight's talk will be about our habitat enhancement program. And essentially it is using fire or fire surrogates to enhance habitat. I've had a lot of colleagues work on this before us over past decades. So this is just a snapshot in time over uh, a lot of work that's been done in the past. Um, my team has three of us in it. Um, in the Wildlife Habitat Enhancement and Spatial Analysis Program. Um, I'm a forester by trade and uh, I work as a program coordinator. And while I do get involved in the field, oper field operations, I mostly take care of our interagency coordination, um, working with other biologists within the department to ensure we accomplish the programmatic objectives. And I also do the, what I call icky stuff of the paperwork and, um, uh, I let my, my staff, my colleagues do the fun stuff and uh, sort out the field work. Um, a little background on me. I went to school at the University of Minnesota. I have a bachelor's in forestry with an emphasis in timber harvesting. Um, after I worked in the uh, private industry for a few years for Weyerhaeuser, Plum Creek, and Stimson Lumber, I went back to the University of Idaho for my master's in forestry with an emphasis in extension. I came to Alaska in 1999. I worked for the Forest Service on the Kenai Peninsula in their forest inventory and analysis program. Um, I spent a year with the Anchorage Soil and Water Conservation District, and then I worked 11 years at the Anchorage Fire Department as their forester, um, kind of working as an extension forester, doing wildfire mitigation and working with private landowners, state parks, and city parks as well. Um, my colleague, Miles Spathelf, he is a landscape ecologist and he also serves as our GIS analyst. So he conducts data analysis and landscape scale modeling of wildlife locations for many populations across um, primarily regions four and five. So he translates that collar data into movement models and he looks at relationships with harvest and the population dynamics. He also supports statewide programs for endangered species and waterfowl and um, he does a lot of other good technology work for us as well. Uh, Doug Beatty recently joined our team in December. He's originally from the UK, but he's been working as a forester in British Columbia for the last seven years. He's our lead field person um, to coordinate our vegetation treatments, monitoring and project logistics. His background is in forest ecology and timber harvesting, and um, that will serve us well in and uh, as we embark on more mechanical treatments in the coming years. All right, what does it mean to enhance habitat? Well, um, our, one of our core services in the division is to maintain and enhance opportunities to hunt, trap, and view wildlife. Of the few things we can influence, we can work a little bit on the habitat. And that generally means that we are improving it by resetting succession. So our boreal forest types up here um, generally trend toward mature spruce or mixed hardwood forests with a little understory or contiguous black spruce. And moose like that young hardwood component, um, aspen, birch, willows. Um, and then so to manipulate that habitat, we can use fire or fire surrogates to stimulate the regeneration of these forage species. So that means prescribed fire, managing wildland fire, or using equipment. Um, to artificially set back succession. Here's just a little refresher primer on forest succession in Alaska. Um, we get the disturbance that comes in and 
we get the fireweed and the young other forbs and small shrubs. Then that aspen low rose cranberry, they all start to take hold. As that canopy grows up um, of aspen and birch, then we get spruce in the understory and that matures and um, eventually we'll get another disturbance like fire um, to start that process over again. The goals of our habitat enhancement work are essentially to increase the quality and the quantity of forage, primarily for moose. We do a lot of work for bison and grouse as well. Um, grouse and moose typically, like, they generally need the kind of the same thing. So that works out really well for these species when we do um, mechanical treatments. We do monitor the forage availability before and after we do treatments. We measure for species composition, the density of these plants. We measure browse architecture. And um, sometimes we work with other folks in our division to measure the nutrition of these plants as well. So we'll sample plants at four phenological stages throughout the growing season. And then we send them to our Palmer lab um, to measure the digestible proteins and tannins. Now that ratio reflects the quality of the plants in terms of how much benefit the moose can get from it. So that's a, a really uh, <clears throat> objective way that we can quantify um, the nutrition of the site. So where do we concentrate our efforts? Um, our can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Yes. Did you miss anything? Maybe about three seconds. Okay, very good. Um, all right, we work with biologists across the state um, and typically we're, we're focusing on areas where moose populations are in decline or expected to decline in the future. And so this means that we work with various landowners as well to address habitat needs within specific game management units. Um, our interagency partnerships through state and federal agencies offer us a pathway to these projects. Um, we also work with boroughs and private landowners. All this work is funded through the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program, and um, that delivers the, the tax, the, the dollars collected from the excise tax imposed on guns and ammunition. This is called the Pittman-Robertson Act. So um, that's all through a federal, federal system. Great. Uh, I just want to make a note here on um, all the connections. Um, it's hard to measure effectiveness when we're doing habitat enhancement. Um, correlating the moose density of an area or a moose population to a specific vegetation response from a treatment is really difficult. And there's a few reasons why. Um, the treatments are done on lands that we can get access to or otherwise have uh, permits for working on, um, especially if they're not state of Alaska lands. Um, and then the polygons or treatment areas, they rarely correlate directly to the game management units and they're certainly not gonna cover the entire GMU. Um, further, the harvest reports that you submit as a hunter require very little detail on the location of take. So we can't necessarily correlate where the animal was hunted and where that compares to the actual treatment area. Um, a lot of times hunters will come in and talk to the biologists and let them know if they see wildlife in an area and um, that's happened in a number of our uh, treatment areas. So that's anecdotal, hard to quantify, um, but useful. Uh, we can also do pellet counts. Um, these where we measure the animal use in a treated site, but it's hard to compare that to a control site where it's not treated. Um, we also can measure browse utilization. That's measuring relative density of the foraging, but we can't get any population estimates from this information. And then the census flights that are done by the biologists, they're pretty large in scale, and they're certainly beyond any treatment areas. So again, hard to make those direct correlations. So we don't guarantee that a biological response, the number of moose, um, will 
necessarily increase after a treatment, but we do work with the research staff and area biologists to assemble a study plan. We monitor the vegetation with uh, permanent plots if we can. We measure the browse architecture and then where we can also do pellet counts, um, we do those and then make those more general correlations with the population estimates at the game management unit level. So our statistics are not rigorous, but uh, much of the work we do is noticed by hunters on the ground and uh, the, their density often increases in specific areas. So it's, it's more of a shift in where they use the landscape. Um, just want to talk for a moment about the methods that we use for setting back succession. And we're going to get out of all this text stuff and get you into some more pictures in a minute. Um, all right, so in any mechanical treatment, moose are going to eat whatever they can find, right? So it's imperative that we treat enough acreage that's going to allow these plants to grow into the third and fourth growing season. So we don't want the moose to eat all the fresh little sprouts that we just created. Um, so <clears throat> In these hardwood regeneration uh, situations like aspen and birch, sometimes the treatments can provide forage for 10 to 15 years. It depends on the site. We have a site down in the Kenai Peninsula where it lasted like five or six years. It just grew so fast um, that it was immediately out of reach of the moose. So it depends. Um, but if we are treating multiple polygons across a larger area, then that provides cover from adjacent untreated forests and also disperses the moose with respect to density of their foraging and um, limit, you know, takes away that predation um, effect to the extent that they're spread out more instead of all focused on one place. So the limitation of mechanical treatments, um, it is hard to affect enough acreage to make a difference with any kind of funding is much more efficient in terms of treatment effectiveness and cost per acre. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but like mechanical treatments right now to run a cut to length harvester that's costing us $1,900 an acre. Um, when we use the roller chopper, it's about $200 an acre. And then um, if we look at a wildfire, let, and I'm just gonna use the Swan Lake fire as an example, um, I'm not promoting wildfire because of the damage it creates, but uh, it is part of our ecology here. But I will just say that of the 163,000 acres that burned in 2019 on the Kenai Peninsula, they did spend 45 million on suppression. But when you convert that to a cost per acre, and this isn't a fair way to compare her, um, habitat enhancement costs, but just for purposes of what we're talking about tonight, it, it came out to 275 bucks an acre. So um, fire in its ecological role works, right? So it's part of our system that we live in here in Alaska. So um, I guess to, to speak a little bit more to these methods, you know, we can clear cut a spruce forest, we can convert it back to hardwood, we can um, select cut a mature hardwood stand, we can expose mineral soil for birch seedlings, we can clear cut or top kill mature aspen that will stimulate root suckering. We can also selectively harvest um, a mixed hardwood stand to just create openings here and there and either natural regeneration or planting can um, bring around some more younger trees. Prescribed fire is one way to accomplish these objectives as well. And then there's the option of encouraging the use of wildland fire where it's appropriate. And those are, um, those are administered and managed by the wildland fire suppression agencies in the state. I wanted to show this um, photograph of the Matanuska Valley Moose Range because it is a pretty stark example of um, an over browsed area. And <clears throat> these aspen in the background, they're mature and they're very tall, right? So the moose can't reach them anymore for food. And these birch in the foreground, they're all stunted. And you can see the brooming that's occurring and that's how we know they're over browsed. Um, they can't become trees anymore. They're no longer providing nutritious foods. 
At this point in their life where they keep getting browsed very heavily, the plant builds up its tannin levels um, over time and browsing pressure, and it just makes for less and less available nutrition for the moose. Um, how did we get to this point in this particular forest? Well, a couple things come together here. So there may have been no natural ignitions of fire or where there were um, fire ignitions, we have to suppress those fires because this is near um, homes and communities. So um, those two things play together. And then also we don't have much of a timber market up here. So we can't um, always mechanically treat everything without a pot of funding just to go in and pay for the treatment. Um, in other places in the world, the timber pays for its way out of the woods, right? It's called a timber market. And, it's a little different story up here. So um, residents who live in this area, this is near Sutton, they've actually reported seeing moose dying of starvation. Um, this unit was set up for prescribed fire, but uh, we had a lot of complications. So um, for now that, that uh, project is, is tabled. All right, let's go to Toke. In 1990, the Toke River fire burned um, south of town, mostly on state land. And then in um, 2015, I believe it was, the Ruffed Grouse Society and came together with the Department of Fish and Game and State Forestry, and they roller chopped um, a bunch of land. And then um, our program got involved and continued the roller chopping effort. So we um, worked with state forestry and some private vendors to use these two dozers and two roller choppers working in tandem. And the trees are about 25 years old. They're between 20 and 25 feet tall, They're about three to four inches diameter. Um, so the way this works is in cold temperatures, the blade of that cat shears off the base of those trees, pushes it down, and then the roller chopper comes behind and breaks it up into smaller pieces. And this helps with um, decomposition and also making more space for the aspen to regenerate um, for the next stand. This is what it looks like after they go through. Um, we've roller chopped over 500 acres in Toke. And so this we've done like many uh, um, variable shaped polygons with different sizes, different acreages, um, lots of edge effect in that case. And um, here we are measuring the um, aspen regeneration in the first year after treatment by year three, the, this aspen was really tall um, and taller than the average snow depth. So then the forage becomes available in the winter time. And as I mentioned, so sharp-tailed grouse can also benefit from this regenerating aspen as they need um, aspen in different age classes for all of their life stages. Um, after this treatment, we took a skid steer and cleared a trail through all the treatment areas. So that makes it easier for ATVs or hunters with dogs to get around in here. And then at the parking lot, we put up a kiosk with a map so folks can see where, um, how to access these sites. Um, I did want to point out here, so this picture shows <clears throat> um, the different, well, so we're, we're, we have our four-wheelers here in the treated area, and you can see in the background the aspen that was originally there. And so just to point out that um, moose can reach up to about three meters maximum to reach forage. So these trees are clearly out of reach for what they can, um, they can get to. And they can still break stems, but only up to about two inches in diameter um, where, where their heads can reach and break that stem over to get the forage on top of the tree. <clears throat> and uh, here's a roughed grouse beating his drum. It's a beautiful photo. Cameron Carroll sent me that. And then here's our, our um, panel that we put up in Toke. So we've got the map and then some descriptions of forest succession and how this work benefits um, the wildlife there. All right, let's, uh, let's head up the road to Delta. So this is, um, just to give you a little context here, the community of Delta is over on the left-hand side. Maybe you can see my mouse. Um, up here uh, at the intersection of the Richardson Highway and the Alaska Highway. And then um, as we head 
down the Alaska Highway, we've got the bison range and these yellow polygons. And um, if you follow the between the highway and around the Little Gersel River, we've got this blue perimeter, and that's the extent of the Delta Junction Bison Range, the state range. Um, and there is some military lands. And then I want to point out here to the north is the agricultural project. So this was established, I think, in the 30s or the 40s. Um, and this is where they grow quite a bit of barley, um, other grains, and also some livestock. So the bison range itself was um, created uh, to lure the bison, the reintroduced bison, away from the agricultural project. Um, in the late summer, right before harvest, the bison like to trample the fields, and that's pretty hard on the farmers. Um, so we plant turnips and other tasty grasses that bison like. Um, Clint Cooper is the manager of the bison range, and so he um, makes sure all those fields are planted for the summer and that the bison have plenty to eat on our lands. Okay, I promised you we we're going to get to see our roller chopper in full view with the D7. Um, so we've done this, this particular setup with this roller chopper um, has been working in Delta and we may move it to Toke again to do some work. Um, this roller chopper was built by Universal Welding in North Pole. It's being pulled by a D7 that's owned by state forestry. The operation does work best when it's below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Below zero is even better. Um, of course, we end up with a cutoff about 30 below because the equipment just doesn't want to run and things break. But as I mentioned before, the blade of that cat pushes over the trees at the base of the trees, um, spruce or aspen, up to about 15 inches in diameter. And then the roller chopper um, cuts up those stems into shorter lengths and then uh, it will <laughs> allows for better regeneration and easier decomposition. So the roller chopper itself, it's huge. If I was standing uh, next to it, I'm 5'8", and I, I come to the top of the blades. Um, so it's, it's huge. Uh, <laughs> it weighs 24,000 pounds. It holds 1,700 gallons of glycol. So once you add those two things together, that's 40,000 pounds. Then we add that to the D7 with its 240 horsepower engine. That's another 40,000. So we've got 80,000 pounds of love putting some pressure down on these uh, these trees to break them up. So um, right now we're uh, using this setup. Um, well, just the D7 last week to make some trails for the bison and the moose to get off of the Alaska Highway into the bison range and make some trails for them to get around. Snow is so deep this year, it's been really hard on the wildlife. Um, we're out there, so we might as well make some trails for them. Um, it's been working. The operators have uh, let me know and the bison range manager know also that there's been some bison and moose um, using those corridors. Um, then today we drove over to the Gerstel field from Panoramic, bringing the roller chopper along. So we're going to we're going to use just the dozer first. We're going to mow down those trees and then we're going to come back with the roller chopper to chop it up. It's too much friction for that D7 to pull the roller chopper in four feet of snow. So we've got to do a two stage process this year, and uh, hopefully that'll work out. And this is uh, a map showing that we've done that last year and this year. So this is over at the Gerstel Field Complex. You'll see at the top of the map there, it says the Alaska Highway. Um, and then we use these other little forest roads to access these polygons that Cameron Carroll laid out for us um, to um, support grouse habitat. And then of course, they also help, help the moose out too. And, most of these um, stands are in Aspen of varying ages. So we know we're gonna get Aspen back because um, once you top kill those, the stands of Aspen, the root system regenerates through what's called root suckering. Um, there's two hormones that work together, auxin and cytokinine, and they stimulate those buds on the roots to grow in the next growing season. So that's how you get so many thousands of stems per acre um, of aspen regeneration after whether it's fire or clear cutting. Okay, and just to show you um, what that looks like on the ground, you see all this, uh, these wood parts. So 
Um, yeah, it breaks it up pretty good. Still really hard to walk around out there. So we'll probably do the same thing up here and run a skid steer or a small dozer just to make some trails to let the hunters get around a little easier. Um, and here is a sharp-tailed grouse on his leck. If you haven't seen this before, it's a beautiful sight. They bend over and they kind of go in a little circle. I'm not a biologist, but I've seen it. It's, it's really beautiful and it's probably about five in the morning. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about prescribed fire on the bison range. We've burned about 2,400 acres, I think maybe a little bit more. Um, just because we had such a great year this year, in, well, excuse me, in 2021, we got a lot done. Um, so we set back the grasses and shrubs to benefit both the bison and the moose. Uh, we started this project in 2017. So they had been burning on the bison range in, in the 90s um, and up through, I think, about 2012. Then some of the national standards for prescribed fire changed, became more rigorous and um, we didn't have the staff at Fish and Game to keep up with that. And um, so then I, when I came on board, we decided we would try that again. So I coordinated with um, State Forestry, BLM, and other um, agency staff to put the burn plan together and get it and um, start this operation again. So this is just a, an example. So this is the panoramic field complex. And in 2017, this is what we happened to burn. So we did 20, uh, 1,200 acres that year. And these are just the units that we burned. And um, I'll show you some photos from, from this operation. Oh, I just want to point out when you look at this map, these are the these big spruce islands, we call them, um, in between what's called cleared margins. And these margins are where we plant the turnips and the other grasses to lure the bison away. And um, there's been some hardwood regeneration along the edges here too. And we have these long stands of, sometimes they're aspen, some of these are spruce, and they are wind protection and cover for wildlife. They also retain some snow in the spring because the fields dry out pretty quickly. So that helps the plants grow. Okay, here's from the air. This was, uh, this was in 2021, end of April. This was unit F. I, I really like burning this particular one because we kind of we could let this one rip. It was pretty narrow and so we lit the whole entire flank on the east side and let it burn over to the west side. But um, we have perimeters, tilled perimeters around everything in the bison range. So that's the only reason we could do that. And the grass was pretty short. So um, it, was a, it was still a safe operation. Don't worry, <laughs> State Forestry keeps a very close watch on everything that's done out there. Um, they're in charge of the burn operation and they have the, the expertise and the experience to, to run that. And we just are supporting crew with the drip torches and ATVs. So I do have to watch some of my colleagues though. They like to take a drip torch and drive away and go light things on fire. <laughs> um, just to show you a little bit about our resource objectives when we do a burn like that, um, we're trying to enhance the forage quantity and quality. Uh, we look for an uneven burn. Um, we, especially in the shrubs, we look at low to moderate burn severity, and we're trying to promote the regeneration of the native grasses and the herbaceous species. Um, the other thing we try and do is bring that height of vegetation down to 1.5 meters or lower in as many stands as we can or areas. Um, it helps the bison see their predators, and so it creates a safer environment for them. So using the resource objectives here, then we work with the fire behavior analyst to develop a prescription, and that tells us which weather parameters and uh, wind that we work within to um, have a safe burn operation. Um, yeah, so these fields are a lot of grasses and shrubs. I'm going to show you a couple more pictures here. So this is typical. You have a little pathway to drive, and then you've got an aspen stand here that's three feet high, and then you've got a bunch of black spruce. That's pretty common throughout the bison range. Here's Teo Fusco um, lighting ATV. Uh, it doesn't always work out to have the drip torch on your left hand side. So we've all experienced um, driving the ATV with our left hand on the throttle and our right hand 
holding the drip torch off the right side of the ATV. That gets a little exciting sometimes. So um, Clint Cooper is the manager of the bison range and we work with him every year to design and designate which areas need to get burned. This is an annual operation. It's pretty small scale. We can do it with four people. Um, usually we get a couple, couple extra folks, whether they're fish and game staff, um, sometimes state forestry sends some more staff down to help us out. And uh, it's a good, good training site too. So some of the state forestry staff can increase their qualifications for the, the fire, um, their progression through um, fire management. Um, yeah, so there's different elements of a prescribed burn. We've got the objectives. I mentioned the prescription, the weather conditions. We start with a test fire. If that's looking good, then we'll just roll right into the operations for the rest of the day. Um, and then we do post fire monitoring. So we measure severity, usually a day or two right after the fire. And then in about August, we measure the vegetation response after the first growing season. That's a fun way to burn grass. <laughs> and here's an aerial view of the 2017 operation. Um, Keto Howard and Gary Bumgarner brought out a drone right after the burn and they were able to actually um, take shots of some of the burn operation as well, but then also got some post fire shots. So that helps us uh, get, a, get a good view of what's going on. And this is us burning in shrubs. Um, in this case, this wasn't an exact correlation, but here we, after burning, we end up with this very yummy moose food. We've got these little aspen plants growing up and you see lots of firewood in there, excuse me, fireweed. And uh, that's great forage for, for moose for that growing season. And then as the aspen grows up, it becomes available in winter. Another aerial shot there. Um, and then these shrubs, so if we top kill them, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we save the root crown underneath the first layer of soil there. So that's what can regenerate. Um, and grow grow more stems for more food. And that's a plot of severity plots right after the couple days after fire. So there's some happy bison over in the clubhouse of the panoramic range. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the next project we have lined up for Delta of burning the spruce islands. And I talked to you about us burning the cleared margins of the grass and the shrubs. Now we want to burn the spruce stands that are surrounded by these margins. Um, the goal is to create some more wildlife habitat. Um, we expect regeneration of aspen and birch in here. This, so we're resetting succession in these black spruce stands. Um, so burning the grass and shrubs that we just talked about, um, that's pretty low consequence, relatively speaking. When we get into burning these spruce islands, this is a this is a different playing field now with respect to the fuel type, potential fire behavior that we expect from burning black spruce. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, wildfire in Alaska or even heard about it on the news or see pictures, um, you know that black spruce is a pretty volatile fuel type and it can burn hot fast with long flame lengths like hundred of feet or more. Um, I'm not a firefighter and I'm not a fire manager, but I work with those folks to try and get this type of work done. So I'm kind of the liaison to, to help my agency do these projects. Um, so we're trying to mediate through these challenges. Um, when we're burning black spruce, or if we ever get to it, putting it out is, automatically going to require aerial suppression resources. Um, the smoke output from spruce is very significant. So we've got to make sure that the community is safe as re with regard to particulate matter and smoke in the air. Um, we've been working on this particular prescribed fire plan for a number of years. We had a concerted effort last year to complete the plan. We had help from state forestry, BLM, Forest Service staff, even with all of this coordination between agencies, we can't break through the, the, the barrier of risk management. Um, and it's, there's a lot of complicating factors. And so we still have this project on the books and we don't necessarily have a path forward yet. Um, as a state, we don't do a lot of prescribed fire. I mean, there's some, 
here and there across the agencies, but compared to other states, we're really just not quite set up for managing smoke near communities. Um, the direct fire hazard to infrastructure from a, an intentionally set fire. And then even though we're following all of the national and state rules and guidance, we're just not quite there yet as a fire community in this state. Um, there have been a number of times in the past where the, all these agencies have conducted the prescribed fires. And even for wildlife habitat enhancement, we've had successes with fish and game. Um, but staff expertise, coordination with leadership, communication with stakeholders, compliance with the regulations, these are all among the many elements that have to be considered and fulfilled when planning a project like this. Um, I do think Alaska is going to get there. I think we're going to be able to have a prescribed fire program with confidence. Um, but it might be a few years uh, for us to develop that procedure and um, communication among agencies to, to do that. So at this time, we hope to keep this project on the books for a potential ignition in the coming years. Um, and this, this applies to the Delta Spruce Islands as well as our Alphabet Hills uh, prescribed burn near Lake Louise. I'll give you a couple caveats why I think could work um, and how it could work. Our staff in Delta have good relationships with the farmers to the north. They're gonna be right in line of that smoke. The wind comes from the granite mountains in the south. Um, and those cleared margins around the Spruce Islands, they're about a half a mile wide. Um, we have experienced burn bosses and firing bosses in the state, and they know how to use firing patterns from the helicopters to secure black lines and um, burn, burn all those units with with um, fire behavior that they're familiar with, right? Um, and then fish and game through our work with State Forestry, we've already roller chopped a bunch of pathways through the stands and you'll see our little black lines here. Those are all roller chop lines and we have some over in Gerstle as well. But just to break up the continuity of the spruce, um, we've also built fuel breaks around all the private lands. Um, along the Alaska Highway here. There's a home there and there's a string of homes here. So we did a bunch of roller chopping and dozer work, um, opened up some of the roads. Um, yeah, we've, we've put a lot of effort into that. Um, we've got burn bosses from three agencies that support the operation and believe it can be done safely. Um, and further, the uh, environmental, Department of Environmental Conservation has worked with us to develop a smoke management plan They've already issued us the burn permit for a 2021 implementation. And um, we had an agreement in place with them to conduct smoke or particulate monitoring um, before, during, and after the burn across the community of Delta um, and out here into the agricultural project. Um, so that, that will help us um, do community outreach to make sure the local residents are safe if there's any health concerns. Okay. Moving on, I'll talk to you a few minutes about Alphabet Hills. I'm at 740, still got the Kenai Peninsula to go. Um, there's so much to talk about and I'm so not used to not being in a live room. So um, this burn uh, originated a long time ago. So this is, uh, the Alphabet Hills are located north of Lake Louise. We've got the Glen Highway to the south, the Richardson to the east, the Denali Highway to the north. So we're looking at these three burn units in here. It's 53,000 acres that we want to burn. This green perimeter is called our project area. That's 460,000 acres. It's all BLM and state land. There are a few private inholdings, and we have spoken with those landowners. Um, many years ago, our predecessors uh, decided to try burning in here to improve moose habitat. After about 20 years, they finally got it done. Um, our colleagues over at BLM uh, worked with Fish and Game. They burned uh, this first unit over here, about 41,000 acres. Um, 
And since then, we've been working on burning some more. And just in the last couple of years, we've put some concerted effort into building this burn plan. Um, again, it's challenging to bring all these components together. We've got state and federal land. The operation isn't going to be that big to, to pull it off, but there's a lot of permits, there's community outreach, there's smoke management, and then there's addressing the risk factors associated with fire and people. Um, it gets harder over time as other prescribed fires get away or they smoke out a community and we have to work twice as hard to regain that credibility with the public. So it can be done. Um, it's better than a wildfire that's unplanned, right? At least you know when the smoke is coming, you know how to prepare for fire. Um, lots of complications. So I'm gonna move on to the Kenai Peninsula. The moose here, they have not quite enough food to eat. Um, maybe they do now. The moose are hungry. We had low pregnancy rates, low survival in calves, a declining population. The um, forests were generally mature. So the spruce and the hardwood trees were tall, mature, um, not a lot in the understory to feed the moose. Pretty limited um, there, but we had some big fires in the last decade. Uh, Funny River in 2014 was 196,000 acres. Card Street the next year was 8,000. 2019, we had 163,000 with the Swan Lake fire. Um, so things are looking pretty good for moose now. Um, not in all areas of the Kenai Peninsula. We're still still looking to, to help some, some more areas in the southern part. So Funny River burned in 2014. This is a, we went back in in 2020 to take some vegetation plots to measure moose forage. And this person is sitting on the ground. This is our former colleague, Mary Jo. Um, we were out in the field uh, measuring browse architecture, species composition, and density. And um, there's a lot, a lot of aspen, a lot of willow in there right now. So those animals should be doing pretty good, but we are able to measure that. So our colleagues from the Moose Research Center um, that's based out of the Soldatna Office of Fish and Game, they captured um, a lot of moose. We collared them this the year following the Funny River fire, um, they were able to evaluate body condition and then track these animals yearly to again measure their body condition over time to see how they're responding to the um, vegetation that's, that's coming in after the fire. It's another picture of one of their captured moose in the fall. <clears throat> this doesn't look like there's a lot to eat right there, but uh, they, do, they do walk around pretty well, pretty good. So um, we did work on the sterling fuel break. We worked with a lot of agency partners on this. Um, I'm going to show you another map that tells you where that is in case you're not familiar with it. But um, between Division of Forestry, Kenai Peninsula Borough, Cook Inlet Regional, the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, Chugach Mute, um, we all worked together on, on putting in dollars and um, people to, to get this coordinated and uh, also contracting with um, local contractors on the Kenai Peninsula to do the work. Fuel breaks aren't directly considered habitat enhancement, but they provide fire managers with the opportunity to maybe let some fires burn now that we created this uh, kind of line of defense around a community. There's all kinds of terms and verbiage associated with putting in fuel breaks. And um, I'm not gonna get into that here, but it, it can provide an opportunity to use fire. It also provides an opportunity to save homes and allow people to evacuate when a fire is coming. Um, allowing fire to serve its ecological role on the landscape is important. We do live in a fire adapted forest. And when it doesn't burn, things get worse over time. It's gonna burn at some point. So, um, it's just the, the fire is hard to manage because it's pretty scary. I just read the 1943 publication by Stephen Hallbrook called Burning an Empire, and uh, that was an eye opener. Completely different circumstance than what we have here today, where we have effective fire suppression agencies, but um, pretty scary. I talked about all the fires in Minnesota and the Tillamook fire and other 
uh, Idaho, 1910. Um, good read. I, I recommend it if you can find it at your library. All right. In the Sterling field break, I just want to give you a little ecological context here. We don't, we didn't really expect to get any plants back in a timely manner because we masticated it. So you're leaving all these wood chunks on the ground, kind of like roller chopping, but they're smaller. It binds up the nitrogen in the soil. So a lot of times you don't really get a lot of good vegetation coming back in, at least for a couple of years. Um, and that's kind of the point of, of a fuel break. Um, but what ended up happening, um, oh, there we go, is uh, there were, because we uh, did this operation in low, a low snow year, then um, the contractors ended up kind of scarifying a lot of the areas and moving these wood chips around. So we ended up with plenty of openings. So you can see the little bunches of willow. There was some aspen growing in there too. So a, kind of a, a nice benefit. And I'll, I'll go back up to this map. I just want to show you the context. So this is the Northern Kenai Peninsula. And here's the Sterling Highway coming in from Cooper Landing to the West Soldatna Kenai. Um, we started this uh, fuel break at the edge of Sterling, at the east edge of Sterling, went north all the way to the edge of the private land where it connects with the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And then from there, went west. And we are actually working today, our contractor's working right now um, on this uh, corner over here. And Chugachmute has been working in here with the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. They're uh, masticators in this site. But um, yeah, so we're continuing this work. Our part is just about done. Um, the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge is going to take over this northern section, and Chugachmute is going to pick up closer to Nikiski. Um, so we might be done for a couple of years, and maybe we'll pick back up again when we can um, head back to the east. So good stuff there. It's many miles long already. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to blitz through the East Fork fire, our planned East Fork prescribed fire to enhance habitat that ended up turning into the Swan Lake wildfire. A um, lot, lot going on there, a lot to talk about. The Kenai National Wildlife Refuge did put together a story map and um, that's on, we are linked to that on our habitat enhancement page on Fish and Games website. Um, right now, we're also working on the Anchor River Fritz Creek uh, State Critical Habitat near Homer. We treated 117 acres last year. We mowed down a bunch of willow to stimulate um, regeneration, and it turned out quite nice. I was there in uh, I was there in July and got a lot of good willow coming back. So we're looking at opportunities to continue that work. Um, we can look at cost and compare. Um, treatment prices for, you know, roller chopping is, is a great price. We'll, we'll keep doing that work as long as we can. Swan Lake wildfire, okay, whoops, excuse me. Um, maybe a good price per acre, but lots of consequences. When we use a cut to length harvester, I mentioned it's 1900 bucks an acre. Um, the willow mowing we did last year, that was um, 12 or $1,300 an acre. Prescribed fire can be a lot cheaper. Um, depends on the site, depends on how much work you got to put into um, preparing, planning, and um, in addition to the operation in your contingency. More stuff that we can't get into tonight. Okay, next steps. We're going to keep moving forward with mechanical treatments. Keep using prescribed fire at Delta. Um, we continue to work with our state and federal partners to figure out what this process is going to be for implementing prescribed fire. We have to address risk management, public acceptance of using prescribed fire, the potential for unwanted effects in either mechanical treatments or fire. Um, and then we've got to start thinking about climate change and how can we build, create resilient landscapes. Big questions for all of us to be thinking about. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Sue Rodman I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and I, I welcome your questions. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for your very informative and engaging presentation. Nice job. Um, Tim Paraguay, actually, our colleague out of Fairbanks, was answering a lot of the questions as we were going along. Thank you. 